In this session, I want to have a brief look at human rights. For a long time, human rights had no place in world politics, though, as I've been at pains to point out throughout the course, if we look hard enough at the Malayan dialogue, we'll find the notion of rights buried away in there. But after the Second World War, the term human rights takes on new life. It appears explicitly in the UN Charter seven times. The UN Charter is over 8,000 words long, so I think it's revealing that human rights is used as early as the third line of the Charter. It's useful to look at how it's used. We, the peoples of the United Nations, determined to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women and nations, large and small. So, human rights are fundamental, and the terms used next to it are dignity, equal rights, men and women, and nations large and small. This is interesting. This reference to gender tells us something, as does the nations large and small bit. Clearly, this is suggesting that larger nations have been afforded more rights in the past than smaller ones, and that there is a desire to right this wrong. Think back, way back to our discussion of Kant and the Thirty Years' War. But it raises another interesting question. Why should nations have anything to do with human rights? Do these fundamental rights not transcend nations? So. That was the first usage in the United Nations Charter in the preamble. The next usage is also early on, Chapter 1, Article 1, which promotes and encourages respect for human rights and for fundamental freedoms for all, without distinction as to race, sex, language or religion. So let's look at those terms associated with it. Freedoms, race, sex, language, religion. We're beginning to see the sort of factors that might be associated with the definition of human rights. The same phrase comes up again in Chapter 4, Article 13, with reference to the UN General Assembly. It also appears in Chapter 9, on International Economic and Social Cooperation. Article 55, Section C, uh, refers to universal respect for and observance of human rights. So there we have universalism. These human rights apply to everyone, everywhere. We can see this as a manifestation of liberalism. But before this reference to the universalism of human rights, we also see in Article 55 in Section A that the United Nations shall promote higher standards of living, full employment and conditions of economic and social progress and development. Let's put this into context for a moment. Uh, the UN's charter is being written at the end of the Second World War and there are a lot of competing visions for what the new world is going to look like. The UN Charter gives an opportunity to start framing this future world. What we'll find is that these two different approaches to rights, mentioned in Article 55, set the world on two very different paths. These rights, mentioned in the UN Charter, are given more substance in 1948, when the UN General Assembly passes Resolution 217, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This declaration is composed of 30 articles, uh, making the types of rights that we're talking about all the more explicit. Article 1. All human beings are born free and equal. Article 2.1. Everyone's entitled to the rights and freedoms. 2.2. No distinction on the country or territory which they belong. Article 3. Everyone has the right to life. Article 4. No slavery. Article 5. No torture. And it goes on. Article 11, presumption of innocence. Article 13, freedom of movement within the state. I can't cover all of them here or go into all of the implications, but what I will say is that the most of the articles can clearly be seen as an expression of liberalism, the primacy of the individual, uh, of the individual, the universalism, the meliorism, it's all there. It's perhaps no surprise, then, that the Soviet Union and its satellites abstained from voting on the passage of Resolution 217. China did vote in favour of it, and indeed was partly responsible for its drafting. But remember, China at the UN at the time was represented by the Republic of China, or Taiwan. Some of the later articles in the Charter, however, are coming from a different place. Article 22 covers social security. Article 23 addresses unemployment protection, equal pay, and grants, to the, grants the right to join trades unions. Article 25 even brings up, brings up medical care. These are not what we would regard as the chief concerns of liberalism. You could potentially make a case that links these to liberalism, but it would be a difficult case to make. Now, 
The notion of rights established in the Charter was strengthened further by two later treaties, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Here we see that continuation of the earlier fork in the road in understandings of rights. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights has a focus on traditional individual rights and as such is favoured by the Western states, while the, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights has a focus on social rights and was supported by communist states and the developing world. So, the sorts of rights identified by the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights include the right to life, liberty, equality before the law, freedom of thought, religion, expression, protection against torture and slavery, right to freely marry and found a family. Most states have signed and ratified this. Saudi Arabia is a notable non-signatory to this treaty, and China, which by now was represented at the UN by the People's Republic, has signed it but never ratified it. On the other hand, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights looks at the provision of basic economic, social and cultural rights, including the right to equal pay, a minimum standard of living, the right to form trade unions and strike, the right of free primary education. But rather than these being inalienable rights, which are automatically ours the moment we are born, the Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights introduces the principle of progressive realisation an acceptance that some states may not be in a position to grant these things immediately, so it's okay to bring them in gradually. Again, most states have signed up for this, but the most notable state to sign but not ratify this treaty is the United States. In some texts, these different types of rights are regarded as first and second generation rights. I'm not entirely convinced by this framing, but it, it's there in the literature. The first generation rights are the civil and political. Such rights are seen as laws. They are binding. They apply to everyone immediately. They provide judicial remedy and a lack of resources cannot be used as a justification for them not being enforced. As such, these are known as negative rights. The so-called second generation positive rights are the economic and social ones, focusing on people's needs and wants. These are regarded as being rights towards which states should, should aim, not rights which are immediately bestowed on everyone. They depend on resources, and they can be applied progressively over time. Well, if we've got two generations of rights, it won't take long for a third one to come along. The third generation focuses on peace, the environment, development and access to resources. An example of this is the 1979-81 Convention on, of Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Over time, we see the emergence of different types of regional or indeed religion-specific human rights. In 1990, the Organization of Islamic Countries issues the Cairo Declaration of Human Rights, establishing, among other things, the right to life, the right for the chastity of women, the right to a basic standard of life, and the right to protest against tyranny. Three years later, the Bangkok Declaration establishes what some refer to as Asian human rights, in which rights are culturally specific. Community takes precedence over individuals, social and economic rights take precedence over civil and political rights, and rights are a matter of national sovereignty. If we accept these as legitimately being Asian human rights, which I'm not suggesting we do, then we see the repudiation of the basis of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So, rights have come a long way, and there have been moves to their universalism. But there are some who see the form of rights manifested in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as a form of Western human rights, predicated on the primacy of individualism. As such, there is resistance to some of them.